Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 232 for Monday, November 4th, 2019. Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. Sponsors for this episode include ChauvetDJ.com and a new one at MeetCircle.com slash Gig Gab. We will talk about both of those in a little more detail shortly here. But for now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in San Jose, California, it's Paul Kent. How is San Jose treating you, my friend? You know, it is, what, November 4th? It is like... 80 degrees and beautiful. I mean, it's really ridiculously gorgeous weather here. I try not to say bad <laughs> words on this show, Paul. You're not making it easy. <laughs> it's, no, it's, it's bizarrely, pristinely fantastic That's out great. here in Northern California. So That's great. we'll enjoy it. Who knows? You know, it could turn tomorrow. I know a lot of parts of the country are record cold already. And, yeah, and we, uh, it, Actually, we've been having glorious fall weather. I mean, we've had some rainstorms, which is typical this time, time of year. But it like I really like the fall. And, and as I call it, sweater weather, you know, where you can like bundle weather. up a little bit. It's not bitter cold out yet or anything. So, no, it's actually been been quite. You can have a fire in the fireplace and and or I can have a fire in my fireplace. And my wife doesn't yell at me that I'm making the house too <laughs> hot quite yet. You know, like, yeah, it's no, it's good. That's good. We just took a New Year's Eve gig. Oh. I just took a New Year's Eve gig and it's an outdoor gig. And so uh, the Whoa. city of San Jose it wants to do a New Year's Rock and Eve. And they uh, they have uh, in the big central park of this town, they always do a big Christmas um, display. Huge. OK. I mean, well known. And uh, they build stage and they do have some music there. And they kind of want New Year's Eve to be the big closing of that run because that starts like right around thanksgiving right sure. you, you know you it's free you walk through it it's all these displays it's really cool that's it's christmas cool. in the park yeah and uh they want to extend and do a big celebration for new year's eve and so they're going to do it's an it's a covered outdoor stage so it's okay. one of those kind of portable stages that you pull up it's got an overhang and you know and so we took that we're going to play that and uh um i russ in my band they have done this, but to a little bit of a lesser extent of promotion in past years. And Russ played it and Russ played it a few times. And I asked him, you know, what is it? What is the weather like? Yeah. Because we've never had rain. We've, you know, we've, um, it, it can get cold, but you know, there's so many people kind of bundled together. And then you think about Times Square where it's ridiculous, right? But people are partying and, you know, people are, you know, yeah. uh, you know, they're, they're jumping around. And so have, have you played a gig like, have you, like, cause I'm assuming you're playing like past midnight. So you'll be playing at a very cold relative to the rest of the day. You'll be playing at a cold portion of the day. Ha Remember weather out here is a little bit different. I, so okay. you know, yes, it does get colder at night, but sure. it doesn't like. You know, it, I think it's, you know, more like we'll be done by 1230. So, I, you it. know, it's not like three in the morning when yeah. the temperature is really plain. Yeah. So we'll see. But, you know, I, I the point, I, the reason I bring it up is, you know, the changes in weather have been interesting. We went through drought for several years. We had a boatload of rain last year. Um, I don't know what it'll be this year. And, you know, we get paid if, if even if it rains and they call the thing off. So that's OK. I mean, I hope it doesn't because, right. you know, the one year I went to watch Russ play, it was really fun. Cool. And it was you know, a lot of people and, you know, they did a ball drop and all that stuff. So I think it'll be pretty cool. I actually had three interesting gigs this week. So I had a I had a winery gig on Halloween, but uh, we didn't dress up and I knew there weren't going to be a ton of people because most people are going to be out doing Halloween stuff. Um, and it went really well. We had enough people and uh, some friends that it was kind of fun. I had a sub who played guitar, who was a, um, a star. I mean, he's just, I'm really impressed with his preparation, his tone, his presence of playing. And, you know, you come across a guy who you say, that's, that's going to be my A-list sub, you know, yep. Yep. that type of thing. So it was fun. I've, I've known him a little bit and I've seen him play in other things and thought he was a good player. And I did a, like a very casual acoustic thing with him, but this is the first time I had him sit in, in a, in a combo format and he was great. And it was just really nice to find a really nice guy, you know, just an excellent musician. So I'm, you know, looking forward to doing more with him. And, and that was the good thing about Thursday. Otherwise, you know, kind of a nondescript non Halloween on Halloween gig. 
Sure. Friday, I did uh, our sing along gig at the coffee shop, and that was awesome. The thing is really blowing up. People, the word has gotten out. It's a fun thing. People come with a great attitude, looking to have a good time. It's just got that vibe and joy, and that's all. That was really great. And, you know, the guys I play with, our buddy Chris Breen plays uh, piano. Um, I, got, I have a couple of house rockers in that group with me. And it's just a very nice feel, very casual. Like I said, no, no rehearsal. I send the songs out. You know, nothing is less than a B. And, you know, there's a couple things that hover around a, a, a B, but, you know, a lot of good A's and A minuses yeah. and a few A pluses. And, and mostly just people have a really good time. As long as I know the forms where, you know, the band is in pretty good shape to follow me. So that's, that's, pretty that, cool. yeah, that's always the key with a gig like that is whoever, and it doesn't have to be the same person for every song, but for any given song, there needs to be a, a a leader that can like that knows the form and can drag the band across the finish line. And as long as you've got that and you can follow that person if and you have good musicians that know how to follow a person like that, then yeah, you're in great shape. You can have a yeah, blast. Well, I also have a really interesting reflection on doing that. And that's like, you know, we're here kind of 50 years into the, the concept of a cover band. Right. And people are always, dancing back and forth between the, the, the brown eyed girls of the world yeah. and, and the deep cuts to show, you know, how I'm going to resurrect this song and you're going to love it and, you know, think I'm awesome because I've reacquainted you with the song you haven't heard in a while. And so th I, I was thinking about this format of playing mostly brown eyed girl type material, a lot of Beatles, you know, mm -hmm. which, it, it redeems a lot of things. Um, it, it, the Beatles are interesting because everybody knows them and no pure, like the, the, the people that the, the judgmentalists, I will call yes. them, uh, yeah. will not judge you for playing the Beatles. Like they exactly. will for playing Brown eyed girl. Yeah. Isn't that that's weird? true. It is weird. Yeah. Yeah. It is. I mean, if you take the existential perspective that someone wrote a song that is that deeply ingrained in, in people's perspectives, you should, you know, as a musician, you should give reverence to that concept. Right. I see no, I personally, I see no difference between Brown Eyed Girl and, and the Beatles in that sense. I mean, I could sit here and argue with you that I, I think the Beatles Full album is worth the material or impact on society, more, all right, that stuff. Absolutely. All that stuff. But in terms of like, take, you take, uh, you know, come together and Brown Eyed Girl and put them next to each other. It's like, yeah, those are both great songs for a cover band to play. No problem. Yep. That's, that's it. I played, um, on, uh, speaking of interesting Beatles covers, uh, but also original music on Halloween. I played with my friend, Billy Butler's band that is called bitter pill. Uh, I say it that way because people that have listened to this show, if you've listened for a few years, you know, that Billy, uh, put together a show that I played with him, uh, a few years ago that, the show was effectively called bitter pill. It had a subtitle as well, but every, every we talked when we talked about it on the show it was always bitter pill. Bitter pill is mm -hmm. sort of evolved uh, from just being that one show is now is the name of the band that he has. And they generally play without a drummer. In fact, it wasn't until Thursday night, Halloween that they, uh, I was the first drummer they played with and it's fantastic. So Billy plays, Billy is, he is a talented dude. Uh, he's mm -hmm. a fantastic keyboard player. He's a good guitar player, uh, uh, like a really good guitar player, uh, especially rhythm and stuff. And in this band, he plays cello, uh, but he plays it as the bass instrument of the band. Uh, mm -hmm. And then there's a guy that plays mostly banjo, but, but you know, some mandolin and stuff. Uh, a guy that plays acoustic guitar. Billy sings most of the time. His daughter, uh, Emily, also sings. And she's a great vocalist. And then mm -hmm. um, occasionally they have an electric guitar player. Our friend John McCormick played. Uh, so it was all of us on Halloween night. But they do. I mean, they probably play four gigs a month, three gigs a month or something like that. And it, I have a lot to unpack here. But what a pleasure it was sitting in and playing, you know, full drum set with a band that doesn't need a drummer. Yeah, man. I mean, like. I mean, I've, and I've played with good bands before where everybody could keep time. If the drums dropped out, it would be fine. But this is different because they literally do full, like, you know, two or three hour shows without a drummer. So they are perfectly comfortable carrying the entirety of the night and holding the rhythm together themselves. It's just how they work. Now, adding drums to that, for the most part, 
was fantastic. I, I think, and I think everybody sort of sort of felt that way. It, like it, you know, it it gives them a little more freedom, so they don't have to, you know, be so locked in to okay, you know, we got to drive the groove. But there was never any concern about time. And if I played a fill or what, like I I could, I had a lot more freedom with them. Even if just being my first gig, we got together and rehearsed uh, once before. I knew all, I know all of these people, and I knew them beforehand. And I would say maybe half the songs we played, maybe not quite half. I I had played with Billy in different uh, capacities over the years and various sure. shows with that Brechtone show. There were some songs from that, things like that. But, um, but, you know, some of them had changed. Like there was one tune that we used to play as a reggae thing and now they're doing it as like a two beat. And it's like, oh, right. I, I, this song sounds familiar, but not this way. Um, What's a two beat? Uh, ta, 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 yep. Boom chick basically is, is to be. Yep. And, uh, but it was cool. It, the, the point of the gig was we played at this uh, bar called book and bar, which is kind of a weird place. They serve food and beer and, you know, alcohol and their, you know, restaurant slash bar and also a library. So it's a really interesting kind of dichotomy happening all at once. Th- these things that you wouldn't normally mix together, food and drinks and loud people and rock band and library. But it, it's a cool vibe. And the books in the room actually really help the sound, which is cool. Uh, but Portsmouth, New Hampshire does this big parade every year for Halloween. And we were there to play after the parade actually there was some other stuff going on and uh but you know we were part of this this show that was happening in this bar after the parade so we got ourselves set up and we had to get to town before the parade because they locked down all the streets and everything which is great fine no problem we get loaded in we get set up and then it's like oh it's time to do a sound check now we weren't supposed to actually start our real set until 10 30 this is probably now you know eight o'clock or something and it's like, all right, we'll do a sound check. Well, we played one song and suddenly, you know, now there's 50 people in the club that are watching us. It's like, all right. So we then went and played like a six song mini set for them. Cool. That was interesting sound check. I didn't even have a costume on. We wore uh, <laughs> all the guys in the band uh, wore uh, nun habits. And then Emily dressed up as the sexy Pope. So it was it was a nice little little mix. Um but I didn't even have my costume on when we sat down for soundcheck. Cause why would I, mm-hmm. uh, the rest of the guys had put their costumes on, uh, but you know, it was, it was fine that I didn't have mine on. And then as we were going through the set, I, I had my costume back behind my drum. So I was slowly like putting one piece on in between songs as this set just kept extending and extending. <laughs> and at one point Billy turned around and he's like, you have your whole costume on now. What's going on back there? I'm like, well, you know, that's how it goes. Um, and then that happened again, about an hour later, I, we were going to walk down the street, the guitar player and I, and go see like some other band that we knew that was playing. And uh, somebody came in there like, oh, you guys should play Sympathy for the Devil. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's great. And Billy's like, I'm like, oh, yeah, we'll put it on the list. Billy's like, no, let's do it now. It's like, oh, OK, sure. Here we go. Here we yeah. go. So we sat down and we played another, you know, whatever, three or four song mini set. And then at 10, we or 10, 15 or whatever, we did our, you know, like a full hour long set again. So it was this really... It was this very like un unplanned flow to the evening that became this super organic thing, and it was a blast. Uh, the guy, you know, I have, I've been doing this with the Friday Night Band, so I send them a song list, and sometimes I send them a set list. But the last two or three gigs, yeah, I've been like, hey guys, I'm just going to call them out today, yeah, and and um, it does a few things. One. It puts people on their toes, which most people actually like. Most musicians actually yes. like, well, cool. We're not just going to read the stuff down and wait and see what happens. I wonder what's going to happen. Creates a new, a different level of focus and a different level of energy. And it was actually really, really fun. And, you know, it also, you know, like I do this even in house rocker gigs. You see what's happening in the moment and try and, and you you know, adjust. find a song. Yeah. 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 But I, I actually think if you have the right players and there's enough prep, and I can't stress this enough, this is... I think a good, a good quality of a leader is to really know what his musicians are capable of. Oh, totally. Even if they don't think they're capable of it, right? And that's that's the key. That's so huge. I have some guys yeah. who love preparation, right? Right. But I know if I call a three chord song, they absolutely can do it. And you know what I? Some guy, you know, everybody's different. But some guys, you know, if I break away from the plan. Some guys, you can see them having a little consternation in the first 30 seconds, 
But when they realize that the rest of the band is okay and, and is blown, and that, and I think that's actually a great superpower for leaders is to really know, you know, it's like, you know, it's like a car, you know, how does it handle? How, do, how does it really handle? Right. Yeah, right. Knowing right. what your band can handle and where you can take them. And, you know, and there's, there's a limit. We've done some stuff where I've said, Hey guys, have these three things. I might, I might call one of them at the show, you know, and, you know, I try to be respectful of time and at least call one of them at the show. Right. And then there's right. sometimes, you know, where, you know, you got to know what songs are. We, we did uh, pick up the pieces a couple of weeks ago. Oh, that's a fun and one. And it is a fun one, but you know, it, it, there's no words to kind of grab onto the form. No. So you really got to be focused. That's and true. so yeah. we hit a little place where there was a, you know, a bit of a train wreck and, and that we got out of it. And, you know, the number of people really knew, but there are certainly musicians who train wrecks really bother them. They're like, oh, I put yeah. a lot of time no, in. I, I see them as opportunities. There's no need. Yeah. Well, and uh, again, I don't know that there's a right or wrong. No, I mean, that's I think, right. But the yeah. leader needs to know how it's going to affect his band. The leader needs to know whether you're sending your band a message that loose slash sloppy is acceptable. Right. Versus, okay, we'll take one chance here one time tonight. Right. And it's again, how does your, how does your, how does your car handle? How does your, yeah. how does your vehicle drive? And so just kind of knowing what your band and it, usually what happens is when you kill one, there oh. seems to be an, a, an awakening, a, you know, a, a, a conscious opening up to taking chances that happens in the band. Totally. Nobody likes a train wreck, right? Some people are more or less sensitive to it, but nobody likes it. No, wreck, nobody right? likes it. I mean, it, the, 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 the fun part to me about, you know, is the almost train wreck. Like we got yeah. into a scenario and, and we navigated our way out of it. Like that can be fantastic. You know, it, that to me is just as good as we're in a song and it takes a new direction that we didn't expect. Like the, the, you know, the unexpected sort of, Oh, we're in new territory. You know, it's that, that feeling of being alive, like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Got to make it happen here. And yes. that, and that is what that bitter pill gig was like. We wound up playing, uh, mostly Billy's originals, uh, which people always love, even if they've never heard him before. He's such a talented songwriter. Sure. But, um, but you know, we also played, we played a Tom Waits tune. We played, uh, sympathy for the devil. As I mentioned, we played Minnie the moocher and we played a version of dear prudence that it, all of us had, I think all of us had played it in separate scenarios but we rehearsed it once on sunday and it was like oh this is actually kind of fun that yeah. that's a weird song because that's one of those things that progression is super hypnotic to play mm -hmm. it's slightly less hypnotic to listen to right and and my experience with that song has been and i've watched bands play it and i've been in bands that play it that everybody's into it when the when the band starts it but you have to be really careful that you don't Stretch Drag. it too long because yeah. you can be like, oh, this progress, this is amazing. And the crowd's like, yeah, but that, that was like 20 minutes ago that that was amazing. And yeah. now it's like too long. But I think what we did with it the other night, we all sort of had that awareness of it when we rehearsed it. And it was like, OK, like, let, let's, you know, make sure we know where it goes. And it actually built to a huge peak. And wisely, Billy, uh, you know, felt it felt the peak sort of crest and basically pulled the air out of it entirely. It wasn't like let's come in for a landing and, and coast out. It was like the peak will be the end of the song. And it was like, yes, that's so perfect for this tune. Cause there's nowhere sure. to go. It's not like you can change, you know, to the B section or something. It's like, yeah, no, it's pretty much all the same. So you just got to stay right here and, and end it. And I, I thought that that part went well, it was, you know, people, oh, cool. the, the place erupted, which was like, Oh, yeah. we, we ended soon enough. Like that's good. Yeah, uh, which sure. is good. Hey, we had a great question about advertising that I want to talk mm -hmm. about. But the first thing I want to do is talk about our two sponsors. Speaking of advertising, the first sponsor I want to talk about is a new sponsor for us, which is Circle at meetcircle.com slash gig gab. Now, Circle Home Plus is kind of, it, well, parental controls for your internet is the way I would describe it, but it's it's even more than that, right? Because kids face millions of distractions online. You know, you've got Snapchat and Instagram and TikTok and YouTube and Fortnite and, and all of the other ones, right? And Circle makes it really easy to take childhood offline when needed so that kids can focus on like homework, chores, bedtime, practicing their instruments, right? And 
That's not the only issue that happens, right? Kids sometimes will buy apps that they shouldn't. They might sign up for social networks that, you know, you've decided they're too young to have. And with Circle, you can rest easy because you know that they're safe inside the guidelines that you've set. They make it super easy to manage your family's online time across all their connected devices inside and outside the home. And that's pretty cool. With Circle Home Plus and the Circle app that you use, parents can filter out what content's allowed. You can set screen time limits, monitor history, see usage, and track it across every connected device. So laptops, phones, tablets, smart TVs, streaming devices, even video game consoles. And you can assign profiles to every family member that's customizable and all of that stuff. So you can, you know, you never stop worrying about your kids, but you have one less thing to worry about with Circle. And I can even give you a little bit less to worry about because <laughs> right now you can get $30 off a Circle Home Plus uh, subscription when you visit meetcircle.com slash giggab. So you get $30 off a Circle Home Plus when you visit meetcircle.com slash giggab and enter code giggab, G I G G A B. At checkout, that's meetcircle.com slash giggab and code enter giggab to save 30 bucks at checkout. Our thanks to Circle for sponsoring this episode and coming on board and being a sponsor. Very cool. Welcome aboard. Our next sponsor is Chauvet DJ at ChauvetDJ.com. Yeah, C H A U V E T D J dot com. I know the name has DJ in it, the URL even has DJ in it. This is where you go to get lights for your band. It's it's you know, they're making the same kind of stuff for DJs as they are for us working musicians that are playing in clubs. It's you know, we're all playing in the same types of clubs. So the same types of lights and focus on that works because Chauvet DJ knows how important it is to provide affordable gear that is also light and easy to set up because they know that setting up lights isn't the only thing you have to set up when you get to a gig and they make their systems super easy to be set up and torn down and carried and all of that stuff. They also make control really easy because all of their LED products have multiple control options, including auto program. So you can kind of, you know, set it and forget it kind of thing. Sound activation modes, wireless foot switches, right? Which is perfect for guitarists like my friend, Mr. Paul Kent over there. And even other remote control options that use Bluetooth. Uh, so you can control from a phone or a tablet with no additional hardware needed. You just download their free BT Air app uh, that's available for both iOS, you know, Apple and Android devices. So you've got to check this out. They, we've used, uh, we've been using Chauvet DJ lights in Fling for years and it makes such a huge difference huge. to have something for people to look at other than you. You can add color. You can you can control the vibe. It, it's really amazing. If you've never played with lights before, uh, it makes such a difference. And you can do this yourself. You don't need to worry about like, oh, do they have lights at the club? Don't worry about it. Just get some of these Chauvet DJ lights at ChauvetDJ.com and bring them yourself. It's super easy. We, it's we make your brand. Them. Control your destiny. That's totally it. Yeah, exactly. Control your destiny. So visit Chauvet DJ, C H A U V E T D J dot com. And our thanks to Chauvet DJ for doing what they do and for sponsoring the show. Yep. 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 All right, man. So, so go ahead. Well, we got this great question online. And the question came in as when is the right time to take a Facebook ad before, before a gig? And this really, a light bulb went on for me, you know, that I'm lucky. We, you listeners are lucky. We happen to have a guy who thinks about advertising and <laughs> extraordinary amount of time uh, who gives this podcast because the whole kind of black hole that is advertising thought, I was thinking about those memes that are like, you know, what the public thinks I do, what I really do, what my <laughs> girlfriend thinks I do. I think advertising is perfect for that because there's so many Mis misperceptions, misconceptions, um, you know, over generalization generalizations about advertising. I know I've spent a lot of money and been been very frustrated with the return on my money. And I also know that some of that is because what I think is going to happen when I place an ad on Facebook or in a newspaper, you know, to promote a gig. And so, you know, Dave, I just 
I just think it's a good opportunity for you to kind of share with the listeners, you know, advertising 101, you know, it, it, these are kind of universal ideas, but, sure. you know, and then, you know, let's see if we can narrow them down and get them more, you know, finely tuned to the concept of advertising a gig. Yeah. So, you know, the, um, the, the tough part about advertising is in our, in today's world, we, we can sort of be misled that just because we have the ability to track, the, you know, these things that we didn't used to be able to track, like you can know how many people definitively like were, were shown your ad and, and you can also know how many people click on it and all of that stuff. And it becomes really easy to lose sight of the fact that all advertising is the same. We are, it doesn't matter if it's a billboard on a highway, an ad in a newspaper, you know, 50 years ago or an ad on Facebook today. The idea is you're trying to get your message across to another human. You are trying to get another human's attention for something that you want them to know about. And in, in many cases, something you want them to do. And those are two very different things. And mm-hmm. advertising is really good for the first one, getting people to know about it, building awareness. And that's a like, that's, that's where it like, that's where the effectiveness of most advertising ends. It's really effective at building awareness, but it, so to give this context, I just yeah. want to back yeah, everybody up. So please. every time you, every time you dive deep down, I'll, I'll kind of pull it back. Perfect. Up. So Perfect. once upon a time, um, when I, uh, was holding my first conference, I knew I needed people to know about it. Sure. How are they going to get to know about it? So I went to the trade magazine in my industry and I said, can I take an ad? And they said, sure. Yeah. And I said, well, how <laughs> many been people, weird how do I, they said no. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I said, well, how many people can I count on buying a ticket to this conference, you know, because they took an ad. He goes, well, we can't guarantee that, but, you know, we can show you that, you know, we deliver our magazine to, you know, 500,000 people. Right. So the data that they were able to say is, you know, I can tell you we deliver to 500,000 people. I can tell you how many of them are women, how many of them are men. We can tell you maybe a little bit about how much disposable income that they have. They had some information about who would get the magazine. Yeah. Obviously they couldn't tell me who would who would go to my page, whether, you know, they they probably had some information, whether if I was on the inside front cover, if that would be more effective than if I was buried in the middle or in the back, you know, but but some information, but at the end of the day, after I placed that ad, I knew nothing about how effective it was. The only metric I would have is if my cash register rung. And so me as a naive advertising, you know, said, I, you know, I placed this, I, you know, spent $10,000 on this ad, Um, You know, five people registered for my conference and clicked the box that said I heard it. You know, even at that time, I wasn't able to set up registration forms that said, you know, tell me where you heard about this. But, you know, it it was pretty it was pretty immature and naive, but I couldn't tell. But I know, you know, now when I click the many, many incentives that Facebook gives me to try and place an ad and having place in Facebook, Facebook wants to tell me exactly who I can reach and tell me exactly, you know, how many people clicked on my ad and, you know, how to set up a, you know, a link that you know specifically goes to the ticket page, that type of thing. But so they Facebook still has but given us one, a lot of tools. But there's one thing they still can't tell you, whether your ad mattered to the person that they can guarantee you saw your ad. Sure. And right. And, that, and that's the that's sort of the thing to remember here. Look, we just read you. Yeah, how many minutes did we spend? Five minutes. I'm sorry about that. I try to limit each ad to two, but uh, but we went a little bit over. So we spent five minutes. This is just shy of five. Uh, telling you about two different sponsors. OK, now one of them, Chauvet DJ dot com. All they all all we've told you is go to sh- check out Chauvet DJ and, you know, we explain why. They they have no way of knowing that you came from Gig Gab unless you go out of your way to tell them. And they're not even asking you to do that, right? I'm just saying they don't know. Circle, uh, they have a little bit more because they they sweeten the deal by saying, hey, we want to know who comes in from Gig Gab. So if you use the coupon code, which happens to be Gig Gab, you know, then then we'll give you some money off of the the service and that way, you know, right. maybe people will track it. But I guarantee you, in fact, it's studies have been done and continue to be done that show that not everybody cares about that 30 bucks. 
and people will say, oh, yeah, I've heard about Circle. You know what? We got to get something for the kids. Like, th- this isn't working out. That Circle thing, I've heard a lot of people talk about it. Let's just go get it. You you forget about the $30. I know that right. You, right now you don't, but you do, and it's okay. You're All it's doing is building awareness, right? But there's yep. it's so hard to track that. You can. You can do brand lift studies and things like that if you really want to know. But those can be expensive. There are, there are some creative ways to make them less inex, less expensive. But when I say expensive, like a, a good brand lift study is 50 grand to 100 grand to really do it right. You can probably find like a really cheap way to do a brand lift study for less than maybe 10 or a little less. But that's still a lot of money just to find out. Did the ad I also spent money on work? Yeah. You probably don't so need that right information. That, yeah. that is actually you, you've got us right to the point. Yeah. I'm a little band and I want to take a Facebook ad or maybe even like my local newspaper, you know, not, not the big, you know, city yeah. newspaper, but my town's newspaper. And, and I'm going to spend, you know, some amount of money. Um, I, but I'm a, I'm not, I can't do $50,000. Right. And, and it, so, it doesn't, so it doesn't make bit. sense for a thousand dollar gig to spend, right. you know, more than a thousand dollars advertising it. Right. So make these yeah. two lines cross. So, so, if advertising is a tool to get awareness for something you want to give awareness to, and we're talking about sample sizes of a hundred people, 500 people, you know, if, you know, if I'm doing a gig, I want to find probably, you know, again, we'll just kind of use Facebook's metrics. I want to find people geographically located who have something in their profile that they're interested in live music or going out dancing. That That's probably about, and and if, if possible, going out dancing to the type of music I play as opposed to salsa music or something like that. Sure. All right. So the sample I have, size is relatively small, relatively small. So I have a couple of ideas about this. I don't think uh, feel free to tell me I'm wrong, by the way. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. I don't think that advertising your your one gig is a wise use of your dollars. Uh, I, I, I think if you want to uh, find people and tell people about your shows, those people already need to know about your band. So very few people will buy the first time they hear about something. Right. And and you're talking about buying. Right. Even if your gig has no cover, you want people to get up off the couch, put their pants and shoes on, <laughs> get in the car and come to see you play music. Right. So they're right. probably hopefully buying drinks and patronizing the club and all that stuff. But, you know, there there is buy in there, even if there's even if no cash exchange, even if it's a free public, you know, whatever you want. To, you want people to show up. Those people need to know who you are before they get off the couch and do that. Most people rarely is the idea to go see a new band that someone's never heard about before akin to, hey, grab that stick of gum or that pack of gum off the checkout line counter and throw it in my cart. I'll pay the, the 30 cents or whatever. Right. There's not it's not an impulse purchase. The first time. So you need to get people hearing about your band to do that. I think if you want people to come to your gig, the best thing to do is to invite them yourself. Call them up on the phone, invite them yourself. That's hard to scale. So second best thing to do is to send out an email list to all of the people that know about your band and invite them to your show. Now, here's where the advertising comes in. You want to get people on your email list. Now, this is a whole lot less buy in than asking someone to get up off the couch and spend an evening doing something that they 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 have no knowledge about. Right. So you instead advertise to get and build up your email list. And in order to build your email list, you need a nice Web page where or or landing page of some sort. Facebook can do these for you or you can do it on your, you know, your own thing. Banzoogle's a sponsor. They will help you build a landing page. Right. You know, uh, but do it anywhere. Get your landing page and drive people to that. Show them a video of your band there. Things that are going to be fun and say, hey, if you want to know when we're playing next around you, put in your name here. Well, now you've entertained me a little bit. You know, I want to know more about you. Now I've put my name in. Now you can send me more videos and more things about your band and you can tell me where you're playing. And now I might get up off the couch and say, you know, I've been hearing about this band for a while. We should go see them. Right. That's where your advertising is going to help you. But it's a long game. You don't get to just put an ad out, uh, you know, on Wednesday and fill the club on Friday because yeah. Facebook tells you that you can pay as much as you want to get in front of 20,000 people. It's not going to work. 
I, you know, you're not going to get, I don't even think it's a 1% return rate in order, like in terms of, I showed you the ad and 1% of you will get off the couch having never heard about me before and come to the club. I don't think it's going to happen. I think you've got to build your audience and advertising can help you do that. Mm. But that's all, that's the best way to use advertising in this scenario. I think, well, I, I will largely agree with you. I, I think that the sample sizes are too small that the number of people that you're called to action, you know, even yeah. if you're going to do something, you know, like, yeah. like respond to this ad and, and you, you get two for one tickets or something like that, that will improve your odds. Yes. But I mean, think about, think about your experience on Facebook in general. Think about the amount of things that are flowing by you all the time. Of course, you as a band guy might be hyper tuned to what other band guys are doing to get people to their shows. Sure. And maybe those ads will stick out a little bit more, but the average person who is a, you know, a casual or even slightly more than casual fan on Facebook is getting ads for Omaha steaks and, you know, you know, many, many things over the course of their time browsing Facebook. And so you, your ability to get a, a moment of their mind share is challenged, much less to get them to take an action. So advertising as part of a total engagement strategy is really what the message is here. I will say well, let this. Me, let me ask you, let me ask a question before you say that though, because I, because it's, it's relevant to your point here. For those of us that, like you said, you and I and any, anybody listening to the show, you are all hype. We are all hyper tuned to notice when a band advertises to us. Right. Yeah. And we, and therefore, and Facebook knows this, you know, we could, we, mm -hmm. we will separate ourselves from the creepiness that, that exists there. <laughs> but Facebook knows this. That's fine. That, you know, we, we know that. And we get targeted with these things. So we see more of these than the average bear, too. How many times has anyone here, you, me, Paul, you know, uh, everybody that listens, how many times have you got, gotten up off the couch, been reading Facebook and said, ah, I'm going to stop reading Facebook and go see a band? Like, has that ever happened? Not to me. I think what it does for me is it keeps me. Again, my perspective of this is someone on the inside looking out. So That's the problem. A, right. I'm hyper, you know, I'm hyper vigilant and aware. Yeah, I know what's going on on Friday night. If I have a free Friday night now, I know who's who might be where. And maybe, you know, if someone said, hey, um, you know, we're doing a special show. We're doing all our Van Morrison stuff. That would be cool for me to know. And yep. it might lean me one way or another. That's right? true. Right? Yeah. Somebody might be able to drag you off the couch to do that. Sure. But that, that goes to the depth of the offer, right? That goes to yep. how unique and different your offer. So if you're and we've talked about this many times, what is your differentiator? So if you're just another four piece classic rock cover band in your area saying, hey, we're going to be here. You know, how much is that going to resonate with somebody who has 25 choices? You know, the house rockers have a little bit of a of a elevated. I don't want to say better, but elevated. We have some brand awareness. Well, that's so the somebody, thing is people. It, but but we're not talking about brand awareness, although we could be right. We're talking about somebody that's seeing an ad for the house rockers for the first time today. They have no idea that you are, a, you know, an established band that other people like. They're just seeing your ad for the first time. Now, yeah, but my I, ads are to someone who might, I'm assuming right. that there's an audience of people there who, who a first concentric circle know us. Yep. Second concentric circle, no one like us. Third concentric circle, know and have some curiosity about us. Yeah, exactly. Those are the people I'm hoping my ad, you know, gets some kind of movement from them. But, and but Facebook, again, I think Facebook will target, will let you target, you know, people that like your page. By the way, that's the smartest thing to do. I know it seems counterproductive because you're like, well, they've already liked my page, so they're going to see all my posts. Oh, no, 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 Not no. Unless you pay for it. Not unless <laughs> you pay for it. Right. But but now you have the quote unquote mailing list. I still yeah. think, though, that someone reading on Facebook is going to be less attentive, less. I mean, there's so much distraction on Facebook. You're just scrolling past and scrolling past and scrolling past that you're going to get less traction there than you would if you, you know, if you sent out the the mail uh, you know an emailer to those same people but if you don't have their email addresses this is you know a next best kind of thing target the people that know you and yes pay to target the people that know you it sounds weird but it trust but me they've opted in they've, they've already asked, opted they've in asked, yeah right i think about the the ticketed events that we do and you yeah. know where the people come from you know so our best one was about 450 people our average one was about is about 200 people right that's pretty good and, 
No, no, it is. It is pretty good, but I've done advertising and I've done not advertising. And um, the advertising hasn't moved the needle enough for me to say, but the advertising in conjunction with four other activities that I'm doing to put it in front of people right. and let them know and tell a story on an ongoing, but certainly the one-off ad is, is a, is a shot in the dark, right? Right. So, totally. you know, me saying, uh, you know, an advertisement, you know, by Facebook, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming sooner. Hey, here's something cool to tell you, you know, emails to my personal list is helpful. You know, like you said, the, the most powerful thing, of course, is the phone tree. If you're really going to get that committed to it. I mean, that, you know, because you're hearing it on the other side of the phone, that the person is receiving your message, right? Yeah. And then, and then, you know, but it seems like, again, even for the small guy, so we're not talking about national consumer brands here. But even for the small guy, the best that you can do is is slant the board in your favor by providing multiple impulses. Well, that's I don't remember the key. where I heard about it. No, you know, but I know it's coming up. I don't remember whether it's on the paper or, you know, or, you know, sometimes they're like, hey, I see this all over the place. It looks like it's gonna be a big deal. You know, that's a, not a bad impression to give for some of these things as well. Well, you'll but notice that one, we we've if you've listened if you listen to every episode and pay attention, which just it's fine if you don't, I'm not this, I'm not right. judging. I'm just pointing it out. If you pay attention, you would notice that we have never done a one off ad on this show. This is the first ad for circle today, but it's not the last. And that's because one offs don't work. You need to craft a narrative. You need to hit people with it multiple times. And what you just described, you know, where you're like leading people down the path, creating demand, creating potentially false scarcity or real scarcity, you know, any of those things. We're almost sold out. We are sold out. Hey, guess what? We just released some more tickets, right? Like those kinds of things that gets people's attention. Right. And, and that that's a that that's a way better use of your advertising dollars. But but that's the thing is you need to put some work into this. You can't just throw money at Facebook. It's not magic. Yeah. It's not. There's no magic bullet. I had somebody years ago say, and this is a little bit, uh, you know, off. I mean, it's the topic of advertising, a little bit weird. He, you know, he, we were asking him, do you want to know how many clicks you got? And he's like, no. And this was, you know, banner ads on the web or whatever. And he was like, no. And he's like, why would I want to know that? We're like, well, everybody wants to know that. And he's like, you know, uh, I've done billboard advertising. I don't count the number of cars that crash into my <laughs> billboard as a success. He's like, the, 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 no, he's like, I, I know that I'm telling a story. This is, by the way, this is Andrew Green, who is with 12 South, Paul. I think you probably ran into him when he was with DLO or whatever. Like sure. he is one of the best marketers that I've encountered in our, you know, in our Apple industry. He totally gets how to like get people into it. If you're a, if you're an, like an iPhone user, the brand 12 South is probably something where you go, Oh yeah, they make really nice stuff. You know? Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah, because he's told you they make, they do make really nice stuff, but so do lots of other people. Andrew has told you the right way that they make nice stuff. And, and now you know it, you believe it, but it's true. It's, you haven't been misled. You've just been focused. That's all. Yeah. So, so for Kevin's question originally, when do I do the advertising? Uh, it was, it was John's thing? question, but that's okay. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, so, you know, for that question, when I do advertising, here's the thing. A one-off ad, so-and-so is playing at, you know, or, or even a Facebook ad that might show up in someone's FaceTime uh, timeline newsfeed several times. That's a tough road to haul to get people to action. Like, St like Dave yeah. said, getting you, getting someone to, click a link to buy a ticket or get their pants on and, you know, walk out of the house. That is a tough expectation on advertising. It's not impossible, but you'd have to have something pretty extraordinary that your band is playing somewhere. It's probably not that extraordinary, right? If your band was playing and, you know, Jimmy Page was sitting in with you, that would be something extraordinary that would get, you know, <laughs> someone paying attention. But as I'm saying, yeah. you, you know, what is going to make your ad pop something specials? And there's a whole science to this, the colors that you use, you know, the fonts that you use. I mean, there's a whole, you know, certainly advertising is a deeply analyzed thing. And the tendency is I'll just do an ad. And, I, you know, I'll say I'm guilty of it. I've spent bad money and thrown worse money after bad money. You know, you know, if I only spent fifty dollars on Facebook and I got three clicks, maybe I should spend a hundred dollars and I'll get twenty five clicks. It's really kind of crazy. I, I I don't know that that as a strategy to sell something 
in particular, sell somebody to come and see your band uh, by itself works. It, you really have to holistically think about everything you do. And I think that ad, that advice is work to build people who have bought into what you're selling. Build your right. mail list, build, build your website hits, you know, all that type of stuff. Have people opt in, build your Facebook fan page. Even though it sucks that they're your fans and you have to pay to act to them, that's the deal. But that is the most leveraged opportunity. The great unwashed hearing about a, a cover band playing at a local club is probably the, not, not the most news, news earth shaking, you know, situation that's going to get somebody to just drop everything and deal with stuff. Um, unless you have some great message, you know, $500 in costume prizes, um, you know, giving away a car, you know, whatever it might be, half price drinks, you know, um, you know, a fun night out, you know, special, special gig for, you know, um, first dates or something like that. Yeah. So, yeah, I think, yeah, you know, you, like you, your idea. band playing in a local club is probably, you know, no matter how good you are. And I'm, and I'm sure John's band is great is probably not going to be the most earth shaking thing. That's no, get share what's action. special about that particular show. If you really want to focus on a show, make it a special show, make it something, you, you know, like you said earlier, if somebody's playing, you know, a tribute night to a band you like, that's a whole lot more compelling for most people than come see my cover band play random songs. It, you know, mm-hmm. like I, I don't mean to minimize what those of us that play in cover bands and that, that play random songs do, but that like, that's what the message is, is yeah. You come hear me play. Come see me. No, it's about and, and them, cool, not you. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, that's really like, what's in it for me hearing yeah. your band, you know, you know, be careful about it. You know, again, how good you are. You want to talk about the experience, but the really cool thing is no matter what, if you get good at this, or even if you just go down the path of trying to refine this, you are miles ahead of your competition totally. in trying to get people, right? Even just by listening to this episode, even by doing this episode and ranting about it for whatever, 30 minutes or something, like I'm already like thinking better about this stuff. So, yeah, hopefully that's true of everybody else. Go Wait, is it about me or is it about them? I forget. Crap. <laughs> oh, anyway. It's all about you, buddy. Oh, Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening, everybody. This is um, this is good. But send us your thoughts. Send us your feedback. If you've had some advertising successes or advertising failures, send them to us. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We would love to hear from you. We just love to hear from you. Well, you're hearing from us. But, you know, we, we like it to go in the other direction when it can. Yes, so that's sir. cool. Good questions. Yeah. Thanks for sending them in. It rocks. It really, really helps us kind of know what to talk about. And it's good. Thanks to our sponsors, meetcircle.com slash giggab and chauvetdj.com. Go check them out. We would we would appreciate that too. What For else sure. would we appreciate, Mr. Kent? If you'll always be performing. That's right.